And so they, they're basically a remote weather station. That's what they shot down. Whether they're going to talk about it in the next couple of weeks, it can't just be about the fact that I don't name sources. I spent, you know, nine years at the New York Times writing about the CIA going after Allende and going, you know, and all that stuff, killing people abroad without naming sources. I mean, you know, either trust what they do or you don't. Yes. I know that you also wrote about Abu Ghraib, significant revelations there and about the mass murders in uh, Vietnam of uh, of civilians and the banalization of the media space is a theme that we touch upon frequently. The infantilization of us as a as the audience class, even with the current escalation of tensions between the USA and China through the sanctions around semiconductors, and of course the rather more visually stimulating and sensational story that accompanies the balloon and indeed the shooting <laughs> down of the balloon. Can I tell you about the balloons? Can I tell you a little bit about the balloons? I asked somebody about it. Yeah, I have friends. And I said, well, what's going on with the balloons? Of course, they've been there forever. Maybe you could argue they could take photographs of what a satellite can see much better. But basically, the, the last wave, the, the unnamed car-like with the American press so full of it, it turns out there's a federal government has a contract with, with the, the meteorology department or whatever it is, weather department at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. The university put has these little vehicles that goes and reports Pilots want to know if there's any unusual weather going on. That's what you have to do. And they are reporters of that information. And that's what was shot down. One of those things was shot down was one of those units that is sent up by a university under, but paid by the government to go over the Arctic Circle. Since there's no official station there, who wants to be there to run a weather station? And so they, they're basically a remote weather station. That's what they shot down. Whether they're going to talk about it in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we put about, what, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of dollars into a new fighter, the F-22, that's coming online. And its first kill was the first balloon that one, that one came over, was discovered over Montana. So the pilot of this F-22 getting the first kill of this plane uh, painted a, a balloon on the side of his fuselage. I'd love to think he was joking. I don't know that. I know he did it. I don't know whether what was in the state of mind. But that's what we're reduced now. We, we've got a kill. We killed a balloon. And. That's worth a couple, a couple, you know, few hundred billion dollars for a plane. <laughs> yeah, a small price to pay for dispatching some hydrogen and some helium. It's over the top. It's over the top crazy. That's all I can tell you. How do you feel then about the context that has to be said, frames the Nord Stream pipeline story, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the years of in infringement upon former Soviet territories, the 2014... You're not allowed to say that. How dare you say that, that there <laughs> might have been reason behind, you know, the word, the language used, the language, it was done in 1990, the first agreement not to go east, when, when uh, East Germany joined West Germany that was in NATO. We wanted to make the combined country. And don't forget, the Germans had a real problem because after World War II, when they wanted to get back into civilization and be accepted by other countries, get in the international groups like NATO, they spent a long time murdering people in Western Europe and bombing it and destroying it. And so Willie Brandt was the guy that said, we're going to be a, a, a money bank for you guys. We're going to be us politic. We're going to be great neighbors. We're going to trade with you. We're going to be we're going to show you we belong. They Willie Brandt did do that. He got that started for all of his faults. And so in 1990, when they joined, Gorbachev agreed to let this unified Germany into NATO. And the price was a commitment by us in writing. Well, I have a friend that has access to the classified part of the embassy and our embassy in Bonn. He went and read the cables to me. There's nothing fantastic about it. The agreement we made with the floor bishop, it wasn't a treaty, but it was an understanding, not one inch. We will not go one inch east. And then we've now, NATO was initially was 19 when it was set up. It's now what, about 170 countries, Macedonia, you know, stuff like that. I'm exaggerating. But, you know, NATO is a far cry from what we made. It's not Europe anymore. It's all over. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe one of the tropical islands in the South Pacific will become a member of NATO next. And so, and so here's the rest is eating this. Here's Putin eating this. And then we start putting missiles in the border in Poland that we claim are defensive, but in, in a half a day, they can be turned into offensive weapons. There's no question about that. It's a fact that they'd be just diverted. But you can fire your seven minutes from Moscow. And that's another reality. What I hate to see in the paper, in my newspaper, for example, they keep on describing the Russian attack as being without provocation, unprovoked. The initial agreement, the initial decision to plan for the pipeline was an option for leverage for the president 
for against Putin. And the idea was to ask the community for ideas. I wrote about this, whether kinetic or non-kinetic, and the word was kinetic. That means we're going to hurt somebody. And so, of course, it emerged. We're going to take out the pipelines. We've, we've been complaining about the pipelines for a dozen years. The first one, Nord, Nord Stream 1, and the new one. The new pipeline is interesting because it's been the first one was cut off by Russia. The second one was cut off by the Germans. They put a sanction on it. So Germany always had the chance, option of opening up the pipeline anytime it wanted. The Russian gas has been supplying Germany and Western Europe with cheap gas for, what, a dozen years. And it's the economy's boomed based on cheap gas. Companies like BASF, which is the largest chemical company in Germany in the world, has been talking to China about maybe moving some assets there. The consequences of knocking out the pipeline economically are disastrous. The key thing is when the president told the intelligence community, I want to see if I have an option. I think the thought of, in my understanding, was the thought of the community was, we're going to do what the, we do what the president wants. That's, what, that's the whole idea of having a CIA. I mean, if you're the president of the United States right now, this guy can't get a thing to Congress. But tomorrow, if he wants to, he can take a walk in the Rose Garden with the CIA director and somebody can get hurt the next day. That makes you feel pretty good, particularly if you can't, you can't, have, you can't have your way anywhere else. That's one of the reasons I think the CIA is a very dangerous community, but full of a lot of smart people. Anyway, it was always to be an option. And what happened is uh, he didn't exercise it. They were going to do it at one point when they had cover in the summer. But the president didn't pull the whistle then. In late September, he did it. And by that time, the community itself had thought there was no reason to do it anymore. You know, it was there as a potential threat, but he'd already done the started the war. By September, the one thing that was interesting, been among a group of journalists and people in the community have been very skeptical about the chances of Ukraine to win a war against Russia. And, you know, if you know the history, uh, when uh, in this when in Stalingrad, when the the, the, uh, the Germans got their great defeat, the Russians were losing 2,400 dead and wounded every four hours in the final days of the battle. And one just kept on going. I mean, they are tough. So far in the war against Ukraine, I'm sure in the beginning it's correct that uh, Putin or his generals underestimated the willingness of the Ukrainians to commit Harry Kerry, as they have been. Um, but by September, it was clear there was real trouble. Among other things, the corruption was so wild among the top, even including Zelensky. There was, they were all fighting for what percentage of the money they're going to steal. There's a lot of fighting and brooding about that, even today. And so it was a corrupt regime. It never was going to be accepted in the NATO. And it wasn't going to win the war. And so Joe, then in late September, wants to hit. And he gets it. And at that point, I think that there were people in the intelligence community who thought it was, a, at that point, that didn't make sense. That was just crazy. And what's he doing? He's throwing in whatever he can. The fear he had was that since Germany controlled the new pipeline, Nord Stream 2, the one that was just built and was just stopped, it just they just finished it in 2020. And it was full of gas even then. The gas that came up was, it's a 750-mile pipeline. Biden's thought was, I want to keep any possibility that the Germans and the Western, and with the rest of the Western Union will open up the pipeline and then be at the mercy of Russia. In other words, the way they put it, uh, um, that pipeline uh, and the gas, the Russian gas, uh, was a weapon for the Russians, a weapon. And once you took away that weapon, West Germany, if, they, if West Germany cannot open up the pipeline anymore, and uh, uh, Germany rather, and the European uh, allies of NATO, well, then they'll keep on supporting us in the war. They won't have the option of saying, We're, we quit. We, we, we'd rather have Russian gas than join you in a war that you can't win. And that's what I think the dominant thinking was. Yes, I think you're right that incentivize the US were incentivized by the suggestion that it, it created the opportunity and necessity, in fact, for harmony between Russia and Europe. It gave that it created conditions that were not advantageous, that meant the solutions became evident and suggestible. It was interesting that you touched upon Ukraine in corruption and the current clear out that Zelensky enacted, even though uh, in reporting from The Guardian prior to this conflict, of course, when The Guardian's perspective on Ukraine was radically different and much less simplistic and reductive, they talked about uh, uh, Zelensky's ownership or previous ownership of offshore assets. We know that uh, the oligarch who's 
who's uh, recently been ousted, who, who funded Zelensky's entire career, I understand it, did have a relationship with Hunter Biden, you know, through his corporation uh, Burisma that was uh, uh, paying Hunter Biden. It's just, it's fascinating, Seymour, to speak with you with your, with your evident experience and uh, cruel sarcasm uh, uh, when it comes to sartorial matters and hats in particular, to learn uh, that these uh, patterns appear to be increasing and exacerbating over time, that a short time ago you could rely on an organization like the New York Times for anti-establishment radical reporting, and now they are a mouthpiece of the establishment. It's interesting that the Ukrainian conflict, you know, much of the aid that's being offered to Ukraine passes from the Pentagon through the military industrial complex. Many of those weapons and assets appear to be quite difficult to track. And in the subsequent post-war reconstruction of Ukraine, BlackRock are handling that, and there is an aim for 100% digitalization of Ukraine. So it's certainly, it seems to be a nexus of a great many stories that coalesce around corruption and globalism. A lot of people, by the way, I will tell you, Seymour, on our online chat, adore you and your casual radicalism, although I'm getting there's a lot of people saying you should not have said that about my hat. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I think you've had a bit of a better time than you thought you would have. I think you've enjoyed this a little bit, haven't you? You've been, you started off a little bit curmudgeonly in your favorite chair that only you're allowed to sit in, but over time you've, you've warmed to us as if being warmed by beautiful Nord Stream gas, the only gas you can trust. <laughs> Your your gas is a lot more expensive than my gas, but you also create gas. I, you're good at creating gas yourself. You're a good gas machine. That's great. All they need to do is fit a pipeline to my face, and we could have world <laughs> peace. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing about you. You know what you're talking about, so that's very. It makes it much easier for me because you do understand what the world's what, what's going on. My only shock is really, to be honest, it was is the. Uh, including uh, the press in London. I must say the London Times was one of the few people that figured out the story I was writing had some relevance. Um, but most of the, 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 the cheerleading for Ukraine was 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 madness all the way in the war. There was, no, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, doesn't, it doesn't mean I love Russia. Uh, I, I certainly don't want to admit to any, any fondness for anything in Russia. I, that would make me out to be really in trouble. I'd have to have my wife start the car for the next year, you know, and there's so much hostility from to Russia that it overrides common sense. That's what it's done. It's just overridden the notion that the Russian Russian army is going to lose to Ukraine. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And when when Biden wanted the whistle blown, blew, blew it up, um, the people who in the community, we're talking about the really the creme de creme, were really appalled by it. They saw it as him making a political, him deciding I'm going to keep Germany and Western Europe cold and broke because I want to try and win this war in Ukraine, a war that he cannot win. The trick that you must, that I will tell you that I've learned in my long, as you said, many, many years, is presidents love wars because they, they're good for ratings. Mm. Oh, see and, well. All right, I got to go. You got to go. No, all right. Put your you put the phone Just down. Put it back on so I feel better. Listen, I don't, I'm getting a bit sick of the uh, level to which you're directing my outfit. Do you want a Pulitzer Prize for wardrobe oh. next? <laughs> I'll see you guys. Hey, thanks By the for way, joining us. I'll tell you one thing I didn't know. I was, um, uh, a lot of people ask me, why Substack? Substack is a, I'm, a pri I'm my own producer there. It's an amazing place. In other words, I'm, uh, 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 there was a, more than a million hits on that story within a, a, a less than a day. And because and I get all these emails from people saying, wow, here comes somebody really telling a story now. And they've uh, they're they're on to the media. They are on to the media. They're on to the idea that there's either one side or the other. There's no middle. And that means there's no good reporting. And um, uh, and so it's it's fascinating. Uh, I think the economics of the, the newspaper business are going to change enormously in the next next decade. Yeah. My last one. See, Goodbye. I got to go to work. Yeah, all right. This isn't work. No, you can't call this work coming on being vaguely oh, I, offensive, no, making I'm some just, gas jokes. We could, you know, the only thing missing is is the is the pub and the beer. Goodbye. <laughs> Talk to you. God bless you, Seymour Hirsch. Thank you so much. You can find Seymour's, Seymour's incredible work at seymourhirsch.substack.com, where as well as providing investigative journalism, he 
cruel barbs come for free. <laughs> what I thought was that had basically the dynamic of the film up, and we were talking about balloons. You know, there's that, that curmudgeonly old yeah. man, and that little boy is called Russell mm. in the film up, who's yeah. sort of like a little bit optimistic and stuff. Yeah. I'm optimistic. What about, like, he's obviously so brilliant, Seymour Hirsch, and, like, yeah. even in the Times when he was talking about all the, the Times, because they were, they were the only newspaper that kind of published it, the mainstream newspaper in this country. And even in that, they were, like, the veteran reporter, now aged 82, like, really trying to do him for, like, being over there. He's, uh, he's so brilliant. I feel like we've lost the basic uh, and positive aspects of tribe and hierarchy, yes. i.e. that person is an elder. Yes. So when you're talking to that person, you think, oh, well, I'm dealing with someone that I would speak respectfully to, yeah. like I would if it was in a family or community environment. When everything becomes this sort of mindless damning of patriarchy, even though there are doubtless corrupt things that have come from authoritative and power-oriented structures, doesn't mean that you lose regard for wisdom. That's how people move forward is by like, all right, take on board what this dude's saying. Mm. Then we'll apply it to what we've learned and what people younger than us are observing about the cultural trends and priorities of their generation. It needs to be some cohesion. Every direction we have, I think, like a kind of deracination and separation that we're not connecting to one another in good faith and in love. There's so mm. much antipathy that in the end, to maintain their line, they have to start dismissing people that are clearly... Uh, plausible, mm. credible, uh, uh, and, and, and in the case of uh, Seymour Hersh, I would argue, quite brilliant. And yep. it's also like, that's the, yeah, like he was taking a piss of it, wasn't he? And he was yeah. sort of like, but he was having a laugh. It was Absolutely. Sort of that, that's sounding you out when people do that, mm. isn't it? Yeah, hey, what's with the heck? Like, sort of, like, fuck with you a little bit, mm. so you respond to it. <laughs> it's, it's like, and also that sort of feeling, he's, he's like, kind of old and can't be, hey, fuck you. Can't, sort of, can't be bothered <laughs> with it all, with the niceties. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty good stuff, that. All of our friends on locals, look at what they're saying. Look, uh, oh, they want us to talk about football. Uh, damn good. Some people want me to be president, although some people like you as well, Gareth, as oh, well. Right. Sensitive Hearts likes you. I could be your Pipe press bolts. secretary. Yeah, you'd be I could that. do this a lot. Yeah, do that. Yeah, if you wiggle your fingers around, <laughs> yeah. it'd be great for everybody. Body. Uh, people talking about, yeah, Zahex 3133. Why doesn't Russell get the Nobel Peace Prize? I think you speak for millions when you say <laughs> that. Uh, Zashex 31333. All right, then. Uh, hey, why don't you sign up to our locals community? We'll read your comments out during the show and you'll get access to all of this additional content. Join us tomorrow. Not for more of the same. No. Because it's another day. We've moved forward. We're constantly evolving. It'll be for more of the different. Until then, stay free.